Andy, let's start off uh, with the final game of today's, which was Spain 1, Germany 1. High-quality game. Is that one of the better ones of the tournament? Uh, yeah, I think the view over here, though, is that it didn't quite sparkle as much as uh, it should have done. Uh, the first meeting uh, in the group uh, of uh, two former winners of the World Cup, but uh, Germany desperately needed something from it. They got it in the end. The hopes are still alive, but uh, I don't think either of them... Uh, caught fire and and as, as we sort of move on with this world cup i think the feeling is that uh who's going to grab it by the scruff of the neck and, and win it because i don't think there's a team out there at the moment maybe france i don't know it's up for debate who's going to uh you know emerge and, and obviously somebody's going to take the glory but uh we're not sure who yet shadow box in these group stages let's look at that group though spain on top they got four points japan three Costa Rica, or we call Costa Rica New Zealand because they robbed us of a place. New Zealand have got three points and Germany won. It really means now, though, Germany beat Costa Rica and it puts all the pressure on Japan, who have to get a result against Spain. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, Germany will be hoping that uh, Spain do them a favour by beating Japan. Um, so it's very much in the melting pot. Uh, and I still think Germany somehow are going to go through, I think, I don't know. It's hard to work out Japan, isn't it? After that win the other day, and then uh, sort of flop today. So um, I don't know. There have been a few twists and turns, but I still think Germany and Spain might be the two teams that go through. But fair play to Japan. You know, they've caused uh, shocks already at this World Cup, and. Uh, not the only team to do so. No, we'll talk about Belgium losing to Morocco in a second. Um, that Japan-Costa Rica first half, though. There, I mean, there is football, and then there's dreadful football, and then there's boring football, and then there's tedious football. And I think that perfectly encapsulated every single one of those that first half. Yeah, it did. Yeah, to be honest with you, I, I've I've sort of I watched them game tonight, the uh, Germany and Spain, but I have swerved uh, much of the action today because uh, otherwise you can just spend the whole day just uh, sat in front of the television, listening to the radio, uh, watching it. So I must admit I didn't catch that game because uh, I've got better things to do. Uh, otherwise, honestly, you do. You just spend a whole month, don't you? Just uh, pretty much, you know, ensconced in front of a, a TV screen. You miss um, nothing. I, I tell you, you that. You missed absolutely nothing. Well, you know, this is the other thing. You know, we get we get eleven o'clock, two a.m. Uh, 5 a.m., 8 a.m. So you got to pick and choose. And I think for most of us, Andy, the truth is, is that, you know, if we watch the late game late at night, then you sleep through the night. You you know, you get up early, you watch those highlights and don't know the score before you tune into the 8 a.m. game. When it comes to the knockout stage, I'll get up and I'll watch all the games or I'll record them at a good time and watch them. But, yeah, I mean, as we get older, it is yeah, effectively you're investing a whole month of your life. Yeah, no, you are. Yeah, uh, it, it's true that actually, and it, you know, and I, I know it's a kind of a, a debate and a conversation and a joke, and it's serious in some households, and uh, about you know the, the amount of time that people spend watching football, and you think, hang on a minute, have you not got a life to lead? And uh, it's fair comment, really, that you do. I don't know, maybe I was when I was younger. I don't know about yourself, but when I was younger, I would watch it. Um, I always thought it was a bit better than it is now at the moment. I think it's a bit sanitised. I don't think it's got the, the flair and the... Uh, uh, you get some... We've had some very good games in this World Cup, I must admit. But And, it, and it obviously, it will create its own memories that will, will stand the test of time. But uh, I do sort of think of previous World Cups, you know, oh, 78, 1978 mm, Argentina. No, one, yeah. Uh, the 82 World Cup as well. I was lucky enough to go to the 2006 World Cup in Germany for part of it. Not a bad tournament, not great for England. But then again, same old story. Uh, but yeah, you, you, you've got to kind of ration it, haven't you? Otherwise, you end up uh, just uh, thinking, hang on a minute, I've just spent the last nine, ten hours watching four games of football and... Uh, it's hard enough in the daytime, but for you guys overnight, whew, that must be tough going for them. And there will be people, won't there? There will they be will, listeners yeah, who will be thinking, yeah. oh, I watched those four games. I saw a feature on TV about a TV reporter who obviously was getting paid, but he went round all four grounds. And uh, that looked a fair old schlep to, to actually uh, go round four games. He missed some of it, but he got four matches in. And if you're a football anorak, uh, the, the beauty of Qatar, I suppose, is that you can actually get to... Uh, these grounds reasonably uh, efficiently uh, in terms of time. Uh, whereas, obviously, you know, if you think of Russia and Brazil, uh, the last two World Cups, you know, well nigh impossible, impossible to get to uh, more than one game really uh, in each day.
Andy Buckley with us out of the UK, BBC Talk Sport, and is so generous with your time, mate. We absolutely uh, love you for it. Belgium joining Argentina and Germany as shock first round lo- uh, losses in the group stage. Belgium losing to Morocco. And there seems to be a bit of a pattern to these losses too, where goals come late, where maybe the favoured team is just sitting there thinking, OK, well, we're in charge of this game, and then they get bitten. I mean, th- this Belgian team has just continued to disappoint, hasn't it, at every single major tournament. You know, this golden generation of players who are on the wane now. Where do you assess where they're at? Well, they came third, didn't they, in the last World Cup? Kevin De Bruyne caused huge controversy with his comments saying it's an ageing team. We're too old to win the World Cup. Uh, don't mess his words, uh, Kev, uh, and the City fans like myself uh, find that quite refreshing. He did this article in The Guardian yesterday in which he even said he gets angry when he's watching, you know, he's not playing for his club and he's injured and he's watching it on TV and something goes wrong. He'll kind of, uh, he'll show his sort of emotions perhaps a little bit more than he should admit to. I think uh, my fellow City fans found that quite a candid interview really to be, uh, you know, sharing the kind of pain and anguish that all football fans feel when their team aren't doing as well as they'd like. But I think he hit the nail on the head. Roberto Martinez has de- denied it, saying that we're not too old. He'd have to say that, wouldn't he? But uh, you look at older Veer, old and Vertonghen at the back and, and, and De Bruyne is the wrong side of 30, Edin Hazard. Uh, maybe their time has come uh, and gone and they've missed out. And, you know, where where are the players that are coming through to take over from that so-called golden generation? But they might scrape through. Uh, they might still go through. And you never know. You never know. But uh, Belgium, I mean, there were, I, I'm just reading a story before about riots in uh, Antwerp and uh, Brussels and Moroccan fans and, uh, you, you know, the police involved. So it, it's become quite a big uh, story, really, quite unsavoury as well, because... Obviously, this football flashpoint has turned into uh, rioting in Belgium and, uh, you know, it's kicked off uh, for all all sorts of reasons there. But it just shows the emotions and passions that football does, uh, uh, you know, create across the world in all sorts of environments. Andy, let's look at England versus the USA, which was, again, was another really tedious game. And afterwards, the England fans... Uh, booing their team. Marcus Rashford has come out and he said, look, we don't have to hear boos to know we pl- we played badly. I go back to, I think, South Africa 2-10 and I think Rooney said exactly the same thing. I remember Beckham in that famous photo giving the fans the finger and it just seems like, I mean, look, you know, the fans have paid a lot of money to get, you know, to go there. They, they, you know, they've got every right if they want to boo. But I mean, it's not probably very helpful and the players don't want to hear it. But you put in a performance like that, I don't know else, you know, what what what, what the hell are you meant to, meant to expect? Yeah, I know. Uh, well, you pay your money and you can have your say, don't you? And uh, uh, that's the nature of football. You're either a hero or a villain. Um, and it is such a, a, a fickle business. Um, and uh, I mean, there's all the speculation now about uh, the Wales game. And obviously, England are going to go through. Can't see England going out. Can't see Wales scoring four goals against England for one minute. Um, but the big debate is in Southgate and his team selection. Um, Foden, there's a the huge call for Phil Foden at Manchester City to play. And then there's City fans who are turning around. So, well, hang on a minute, don't just suddenly put the huge spotlight on him and the expectancy and the, the, that weight of the nation on him uh, just to suddenly uh, perform in one game. I know, I know uh, selections are such that uh, you've got to take your chance when you get into the team. But yeah, I think it was fair comment. England getting booed and uh, it, that's the, the nature of the game. Just uh, accept it. And uh, I know, having scored six against Iran and then it backfires, and against the USA, it was so turgid that uh, it was unbelievable, really. But uh, we've seen it all before. And uh, perhaps, you know, it, it, it's a bit of a wake up call that England, well, they didn't really need it because they went into the tournament on in poor form. But. Uh, it's how you have finished this sort of seven-game tournament. Seven games to win the World Cup, and that's it. This is, sounds simple, but it's more complicated than that, as we know. Andy Buckley is with us. Here's a question for you. It might be a bit from left field, but Gareth Southgate, as a coach, just seems so conservative, so defensive-minded. He seems to um, the, the, the team seems to play fearful, or they're so passive against the United States. They'd rather, it seems to me, looking from afar, rather not concede than score a goal. And I'm wondering whether you know it might be time for. Here am I telling you what to do. But English football fans to open their minds up a bit. And this group of players is a fantastic group of players. Imagine what would ha- you know what Jurgen Klopp could get out of this team, or or uh, Pep Guardiola could get out of this team. And I know you've had foreign coaches in the past, 
But, you know, a guy that actually thinks and wants to play football with this group of players, it just seems that, you know, you've got everything, all the pieces in place, but for some reason Gareth Southgate just doesn't want to let them play. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, although having said that, you know, Raheem Sterling, should he be playing in the England no, team at the moment? I'd I say no. So. No. Uh, you know, and yeah, he sticks with him. He sticks with Mason Mount. Uh, yeah, there, there are there, there are some of those talented players in the world, uh, and it's getting that chemistry right. And obviously, Jurgen Klopp, um, you know, regarded quite rightly as one of the top coaches in the world. But even though he's got a, a star-studded Liverpool side, even he hasn't got the, the the mix right on the field this season. Guardiola last few seasons obviously has more times than not certainly in the English domestic game but uh, I think it's his stubbornness you're right his sort of conservatism uh, Gareth Southgate that angers people because he's obsessed with Mason Mount he's obsessed with Sterling Uh, he's got Saka now who, who provides a little bit of that kind of dynamism that Sterling on a good day would provide Um, so you just show a little bit more ambition, a bit of courage, a bit of risk, a bit of dare, uh, and and you know put Foden in. Foden is the most gifted technician in English football, uh, and if England were to go out of the World Cup because they hadn't used Foden enough, um, then and Madison, I think Madison should play against Wales. Yeah, good player. Uh, I don't think I don't think England run that much pressure against Wales, and it maybe it's a chance just to sort of. Not experiment, but to, to sort of, you know, give Froden a free run. And, you know, they're saying, well, I, I think the signs are that Harry Kane will play, but people are saying, well, leave him out. He's obviously got a bit of a problem with his ankle. Leave him out, rest him, because there's going to be other matches when he's going to be needed, and put Marcus Rashford up top, play maybe Madison, Grealish and, and Foden, and, and shake it up a bit and, and just get a bit of the stagnant players that are in there. Mason Mount's a very good player. But he's he's not quite hit the heights so far in this uh, World Cup or previously that I would have liked to have seen from him. People might turn around and say, well, Foden scored, what, two goals in about 17 games for England. So, you know, his track record isn't exactly sparkling. And yes, I get that. But I just read a report today saying that if Manchester City were playing in the Champions League Cup final tomorrow, Phil Foden would be playing on the left for Manchester City. So, you know, if... He's, 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 he's arguably our best player. So play him. Just play him. Take a risk. You know, don't don't die wondering. Uh, you know, just do it. Um, uh, and have that courage. And I'm not sure whether when push comes to shove, Southgate has got that really, that, 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 that bravery about him. And that, that's the big fear, that if we were to go deep into this tournament, whether he'd actually just play that sort of same way that's just kind of uh, I don't know stodgy really stodgy football and okay it will work against teams like Iran but when it comes against the very best my my, my big question though is and I mentioned this at the start who are the very best who who are the well I was going to ask you finally this is it France you know you've been impressed with them obviously they're playing well but I I mean it looked to me you know and we've been watching the rugby autumn internationals trying to figure out next year's rugby world cup and it's probably the most open and that there's no real standout team maybe that's the that's the story with this FIFA world cup as well that we're kind of waiting for a you know a team to be above everyone else and we just don't know yet no we don't And, and there's a lot of aging teams I mean you know, there's people saying, well, Portugal would be better off without Ronaldo. All right, Messi came to life in the second half uh, last night against a very average Mexican team. Uh, France, yes, but not. I don't think France, are, you think, oh, wow, what a great team. They're the best of a bad bunch. I know that might sound a bit ridiculous when you play in the World Cup and you're thinking, hang on, they're these best teams in the world. But it's not exactly been... It's been a, it's been a great World Cup because of the shocks that we've had and the underdogs who caused these surprises, uh, including um, New Zealand's aliases Costa Rica, as you mentioned at the start. So it's been a great World Cup because of the surprises we've had. But it's not been a vintage World Cup in terms of the stars and the players. You think, wow, he's the next best thing in world football. They may emerge over the next couple of weeks before we get to the final. And we think, yeah, what a player, what a team. But there's nothing that jumps out at the moment. You're thinking, oh, hang on a minute. They're going to take some stopping. Uh, there, there isn't that kind of uh, classic, you know, all black type team that you think, oh, wow, they're going to, you know, I, I know, maybe the all blacks aren't the same uh, caliber that they used to be. But, but that, you know, that, that sort of standout team, really.